welcome back to part two of the December edition of GFM Talks. I'll hand over to our second speaker this evening, Stuart Tyreman, head teacher at Lord Wilson Academy. Lord Wilson was the first school within the GFM to experience an Ofsted inspection under the new education inspection framework. And Stuart's here this afternoon to talk about the first hand experience from LWS and to give us some, some tattoos. Uh, and, and tips as we as, as we think about the new inspection framework. So I'm handing it to Stuart. Yeah. Afternoon all. Um, apologies for my slap for me there. Just hurt my knee somewhat, so I'm just, uh, just making sure that I'm supporting on that basis. Um, I've put a series of eyes throughout the whole presentation, worth a second look. There is so much to kind of cover, potentially, in, in kind of a 20 minute or so window, that there are areas that I invited the team at LWS kind of to draw your eyes the attention of to the presentation. They've also contributed to the presentation. So although I'm speaking and taking you through it, it is very much a team-led effort um, in terms of communicating the message to you of some areas that might be worthwhile intelligence for you moving forward. And I'll do my best to endeavour to answer any questions either at the end or even if you want to bring attention to something as we go through. Um, before I kind of progress, I'll go, well, I'll go on to the second slide. At the executive message from the trust, that that was shared across on that internet, day. and I stand 100% behind that. I also want to share, before I go into kind of the, the ins and outs of the whole inspection framework, that our preparation for this inspection started from the moment we were identified at RI our last inspection. And it was that team effort from that point to this point which aided all the preparation for the two days that we had. And I think that's really crucial because the whole environment at LWS embraced the challenge okay, and became aware that they, everyone had to live it. From the students right the way through to the leadership team. And as I go through the presentation, the, the new framework is about the student experience. What's it like to be a learner in that school? And in our school, the journey we took our young people on and our staff was to make sure that they felt that they had a duty to seek improvement and not to prove to everyone what they were doing. That was quite a difficult mantra to adopt from the outset. But actually, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Because it's an, an obsession to get better. Reality versus the hype. I believe the slides we shared afterwards, I'm just thinking in terms of the size of the text that's on the board. <coughs> um, new handbook. Lots in there. Summary. Very much the same beast. Offset. Slightly different branding. Okay, going back to what I was saying before around the focus 100% on the learners' experience. I'll start off with a pre inspection phone call. Lots been talked about with that. What was that really like? It was interesting to the point of which the um, ins lead inspector that was speaking onto the phone was phoning from her study at home, and she had two Amazon deliveries during the, during the actual <laughs> phone call. What was quite interesting retrospectively to look back on what those Amazon deliveries did for us was to give an opportunity for me and Chris, who's my my, my deputy over at LWS, to just pause and reflect on the dialogue that we've been having to date. And actually, I'm looking back, that would be an absolute must and something that I've already shared with many leaders across the trust. Find a way to buy yourself time. And that preparation beforehand, again, being key. Not so much on the long term, but thinking about what you want to cover in that 90 minutes. How do you ensure that the context of your organisation is shared with the lead inspector, inspector to, to display the picture that she's going to bring her team into experience. Not, for set, not, not to mention, the homework that was done was thorough. So, by planning ahead, taking into consideration what's on your website and so forth, that's the lens that had already been looked at before that phone call had begun. And that 90 minutes whizzes by. So find those Amazon deliveries in amongst that time. Okay, or pre-order, by the address, but you know, bathroom break. New button was pressed occasionally. It's, it was quite quite interesting, but I would absolutely, for 
any leader that's involved in that telephone conversation, find a way to communicate and just have a break as the 90 minutes passes through. There's, with the new top headings and the areas of the inspection, it is, to my understanding, it still is, is that they're not weighted. Okay. Now, we didn't go into a preconception thinking everything's not weighted, but the, the reality dawned on us as we progressed through the inspection that there certainly was a weighting that emerged. And there has been a diagram that's been doing the rounds where in terms of the literature within the handbook has been weighted of offset quality of education against the other three areas. As we work through the days, I just want to really draw your attention that quality of education judgment is absolutely key. You know, and actually the content within the quality of education, I don't disagree with it being absolutely key, but just be mindful of it. Be mindful of the depth at which it's going to be rigorous in, it, in the, in the uh, inspection team's exploration of your quality of education within your organisation. Another bit of a shock for us, again, talking around the new framework, there was a lot said about a, a lack of attention towards progress data and outcomes. For us, very early in the inspection, when we wanted to celebrate our data and the journey that we've been in over the last two years. We were able to share it and then that was it. There wasn't another discussion about that throughout the whole two days, which we found to be <coughs> quite a great shame, but we had to then think on our feet in terms of what are we going to make sure that we can do to demonstrate and evidence the learning journey and the progress. And as I go through the slides in a minute, Chris, my deputy, popped on there as a top tip from him in terms of learning how to discuss progress without mentioning progress. And it's quite a funny way to start to think, but how do you do it in terms of evidence base? What might you use and what journey might you present without talking about progress towards a measurable outcome? The dugout scenario. I nearly put a picture up there of a football dugout. Is everyone familiar with what I mean by a football dugout? You see the manager and you see the team in there and they're sat there and they're watching the game. For me, having been through a number of offset experiences, I felt more in the dugout than I ever have done as a head teacher, as did the SLT team. Once the game started, as that 90 minute phone call, that was probably the greatest input I had during the journey until we were starting to get feedback. And those keeping in touch meetings are quite minimal with the leadership team, because again, going back to the focus being the learner experience, they want to spend as much time as possible on the ground, living the school. I think I have touched already on the day plan draft, and just make sure you've got flexibility <coughs> in there for day one, and try and get day one fairly set. But also the deep dive activities. We'll go on to the deep dive in a second, but it's in that 90 minute phone call you have that discussion around what are the areas we would like to suggest the deep dive. Bear in mind they've already looked at previous inspection report and the current data sets. That is a dialogue. And what was agreed for us were English and maths and food technology. And there was a real stress from the outset around staff wellbeing in that 90 minute phone call. Making sure that we were aware as a leadership team this would be a constant theme throughout the inspection. Our interpretation of the language. I can only give it from that point of view and how we experience the deep dive. It's an intense scrutiny okay, of the agreed curriculum areas that you've discussed in the 90 minutes. When I talk about intense scrutiny, it quite literally is well named. It is a deep dive. They keep digging and keep digging. And it will lead into it did lead into this, this whole idea around the systemic approach to teaching and learning. So how do you link everything and contribute towards that end outcome? Which by the way we didn't want to talk about PA or MP. But how do we get them get our young people ready for the next stage in their education? It was interesting that in the in the initial dialogue that we had and with the lead inspector, because intent 
implementation and impact was kind of some key technology that was being batted around. As soon as that was referenced by the leadership team within that meeting, we were corrected quite quickly not to use the term intent, implementation and impact. We don't want to use, I don't think they quite said jargon, looking at Ian, but I don't, we don't want to use labelling. But I'll give you another, another label, she said, I'll give you another word, which was systemic. And that was the word that she kept returning to. And our understanding as we worked with the leading lead inspector and her team is that learning journey. How does it all connect? Why are you doing what you're doing? To what end? So it is, what's your intent, implementation, and impact, but it's the systemic connectivity of it. <coughs> safeguarding. I'm hoping and I trust everyone understands what safeguarding means in this room. Why, the reason why we put on, on this slide was because it was never finished. Now that always felt like the case when you were being inspected previously. But if you imagine there's a fourth deep dive, the fourth deep dive was safeguarding and it was never finished. Every opportunity they got to investigate from whatever angle to make an inquiry about processes around safeguarding, they, they did. That's with the young people, that's with the LSA staff, that's with our reception staff, that's with the leadership team. So it was never done. And once they latched into something, they borrowed. So for us, one of the areas that they went to with the safeguarding was around alternative provision. What safeguarding processes do we have in place for the alternative providers that we use? How do we monitor that? How do we quality assure that? I've already referenced the student experience. And again, that triangulation is going on all the time. What are the students saying? What are the, what are the staff saying? What does the data tell us from the, the self-evaluation of the 90 minute phone call? Where's the inquiry being made? And that staff survey and staff wellbeing, that was their voice more than anything. They wanted to make sure that the staff had a voice in the school. Were they contributing to the development of the organisation? Did they get a say? Interesting enough, lots of queries around, could the leadership do less? Could there be less administrative tasks that you might ask for? Certain data sets that we were looking at when we were scrutinising attendance. So more about, did it be refined? Did you get an opportunity to kind of suggest how much you do or, or don't contribute to which is quite interesting when we talk about the, the level of scrutiny because the intensity for such a small organisation, which might well be different for a larger organisation, was very high, certainly a concern for me for the well-being of the staff throughout the two days. Interesting what I put at the bottom. We will have a glance at it just to get your heads around it. I'm hoping you understand where I might well be coming from. This was an emerging theme for us over the, um, the two days. We were starting to recognise dialogue that we were having with the inspection team when we were trying to almost gratify context, certainly as school leaders. So are we talking about the trust at the moment and the context of the trust? Are we talking about the school in the context of the school? Or how does the trust be the school and how is the school representative of the trust? And they would jump between trying to gather an understanding mainly occurred when they were exploring around the governance. And for GFM schools, that's going to be a key area in terms of our local governing committee. <laughs> our local committee. Okay. So these are some very key tips that the team kind of brought out to them. Be prepared, I said that at the beginning. Okay. First impressions count. I go back to what I said about the preparation for this happened over the two years since the last inspection. We got into a routine for any visitor that came into LWS. They did a tour of the school. Now you might already do that. They went around the school and we encouraged them to meet and greet the boys all the time. It was an interesting experimental phase as our boys came to terms with the meeting group that was expected of them. But change occurred. And so going back to that emphasis that it, it wasn't done overnight this and you certainly it's not a system or a process that you can just wing it now on outcomes. It's about the actual culture of the organisation. That prepared, have a foresight around, okay, chronologically, how might you present information okay, that demonstrates progress over time, so books. So we ended up in day two, 
gathering a series of books for the, the inspector of a particular number of young people that demonstrate a wide range so they can look at the journey when they arrive at the school, where they were either currently and where might they be going to in terms of their learning. And then we shared that with them. I say we led that, we made sure that we were able to identify certain young people and then there were some young people who were also selected but they were key groups, so looked after children for example, PP children, and then we got some bonuses in there. Okay. But that was a really worthwhile exercise. With hindsight, if we'd had all that ready in that way, that would have been quite useful. I've already mentioned that in the 90-minute phone call. Try and predict those curveballs behind them. It's that age-old thing. What can go wrong, will go wrong. Okay, so what, what, do you, what could you anticipate going wrong? So for us, on that first morning, there was an accident on the M27. So we had a delayed start to our day, which disrupted us right from the beginning. So we were already thinking, what are our plans? How do we manage it? And we'd run those sorts of scenarios before. What are the curveballs? And by de definition, the curveballs aren't always easy to identify. But having some thought and some time into that. All the young people at Lord Wilson, Lord Wilson have education, health and care plans. However, there was, a, even though they all had the HCPs, there was an intense scrutiny around them. So making sure teachers were well aware of the learning needs that sat within the HCP. We talked about the 90 minute phone call. Member of staff, pop that in there. If you don't know the answer, explain that you know how to get it. I love the second sentence. Don't say anything you can't evidence. So don't give the team that's inspecting you something if you then can't back it up at all. And it's okay not to know the answer as long as you know what the answer is and who to go to. I've already mentioned the B word and I've also mentioned the three eyes in terms of not being wanted to look at that. We had a 100% return on the staff survey. That, we really stressed that to the team on how it was important that they had a voice. And that I, I, although I don't know in full detail exactly what's expressed, I know it was positive and I know it made a difference. And that actually comes out in the report. It's about the learning journey, and I've also mentioned about the triangulation. So, those are some ideas. Key considerations, so a bit of consolidation here around some of the things that I've covered. Know the handbook. Do make sure you know the handbook. It was an interesting moment in the journey for us when I made a reference of a section within the handbook to which there was a reply to me, oh sorry, didn't you get the memo because they'd taken that out? That was quite interesting because the goalposts were literally shifting as we were doing the inspection. But it was important that we knew the handbook, so we were able to articulate the handbook back to the inspection team because the inspection team were using the handbook to obviously hold us to account. There was a reality that there were two and a half weeks into the new framework when they came to us, and whether that has changed as the experience has grown. I'm not to know. Make sure you can evidence everything. Talked about progress measures, so books, pictures, student voice, staff voice, staff surveys, schemes of work, all those things that don't give you necessarily a number at the end, but can clearly show you with your professional eye that the other person has moved from A to B. And if they don't write very well, have you got a pictorial representation? What are you using to evidence what impact you're having on that young person's learning? And are you taking the way you, you're designed to take them for, to making sure that they're, um, they're ready at 16? I mentioned sequencing already, intensity and staff wellbeing. It's an interesting one. We found it incredibly intense because we're a small setting. It might well be the same with the primary, but there was an interesting challenge for us in terms of there was an expectancy during the deep dive for teachers to be interviewed during the school day. So obviously that creates a potential ripple effect in terms of disruption around the school. So again, just thinking that through, how are we going to manage that? Because it wasn't a case of saying, oh no, we can't do that. We had to find a way of doing that. Um, I think I'm just you some simple figures for us in terms of numbers for that. So uh, we had three inspectors on day one, we've got seven teaching staff. Kind of nowhere to hide, really, is there, at that stage. 
Okay, inspection team represents an additional 18% of adults on the ground at LWS. So just thinking about how that's managed. Again, big school, we might have the reverse effect. Medium-sized school, where does that sit? So again, it's not a case of saying, oh, quite intense for us. Think about it. Think about how you manage that. Because how everyone's managing this situation will create a different ambience within the organisation. Day two, as on previous inspections, or day two point, whatever it would be named by that stage, very rushed. It was almost like cramming, it's before you know, because there was so, so little time in the context of an organisation, and with the deep dive you're now adding in there, there's even more to cover, hence why there's a bit more succinctness around some very key risk areas, which I would understand why safeguarding is almost top of the pile. There's always going to be areas to improve in any organisation, and especially if you look hard enough. I stand by the fact that if you're able to identify that for them and explain what you're doing about it, that's all you can do. I said it earlier, very evident, homework has been done and the website scrutiny. Eyes are on there, make sure your website has everything you need to see. First impressions count, which I've said earlier. In particular scrutiny around the LGC Trust, they've read the Trust Minutes before coming highlighted a particular reference to our young people and just queried it. So they've read through the trust minutes. And I've already mentioned the quality assurance and the AP. <coughs> Key areas for us. So again, kind of this was our battleground over the, the, the two, in particular the, the, the two days. And the outcomes for us around literacy and attendance. And I, and I think it's important I stress another reason why in the executive message and the, the training day, as training, the inset day that we did um, as a trust, there was emphasis on literacy. This is an area where there is intense in, increased scrutiny, certainly within the new framework. It's heavily weighted throughout the handbook. And probably, on our part, and not enough focus on that level of intervention that we were doing with our key stage three young people, for some of them. We had identified it, and we had it popped it into our school development improvement plan. But as I popped on there in the bold, that there's an understanding about it's where you're now, where you are at right now, not where you're going. It was interested, it wasn't embedded. So it was about the learner experience at that moment in time. And attendance, top tip on attendance, again, interesting dynamic on this one, because historically, <coughs> the whole of school attendance, that was it, that's what you're going to be kind of judged upon. For us, and that's why I put the caveat at the beginning, they accepted the argument, this is the whole school, this is how we start, but then we do look at the individual areas within our attendance, and our homeschool link worker and the log the log that we um, that she kept over the two year journey as she was doing these interventions was absolutely crucial because you could see a clear evidence trail of starting point, action, impact and we might have been taking a young person's attendance from 23% to 60% but that was still near enough a 40% increase and that was seen as having a, an impact, and they could see how it linked into our journey for that young person, going back to their EHCP, which then the whole word systemic becomes quite clear, but it's how it all kind of bleeds into each other. And that is it. Any questions? Oh, I've got a round of applause. That is it. Thank you very much.